Dr. Brendan Gabriel from the University of Aberdeen. Um, Brendan did his PhD there and has found his way back via working in Copenhagen, Karolinska Institute in Sweden, Edinburgh University, and he's now at the Rowett Institute, a very renowned institute now linked with Aberdeen University. So I am going to let him explain what he does, <laughs> because I'm not sure that I can. <laughs> and hopefully I can come out with this one and let Brendan Yes, I can, I'm sure I can take okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> so firstly, um, a massive thanks to um, Claire and Tom for the invitation to speak here today. Uh, really excited to, uh, to talk to you today about circadian rhythms and diabetes. What might go wrong? Um, in, in metabolic disease in terms of circadian rhythms and you know, what we can potentially do to, uh, as we term it, sort of reset the clock. And, and just a massive thank you to everyone in the audience for um, turning out on what might be a slightly uh, wet and windy um, evening in, in Perth. So before I um, get into my talk today, um, I didn't realise Claire was going to do such a fantastic introduction, so I've actually got a few slides just to quickly introduce myself. So. I'm an assistant uh, professor at the University of Aberdeen, as, as Claire said. Um, that means I lead a, uh, a small team of, of researchers. Um, part of my job is, is to sort of give lectures and talks either to students or fellow scientists. Um, and you know, I apologise in advance. I've had quite a busy week of lectures, so I might may well uh, lose my voice slightly in, in the talk tonight. But um, hopefully, I won't sound too much like a, a jazz singer. Um, <laughs> So we work in a variety of lab settings. We have a, uh, a molecular biology lab um, where we sort of take samples and look at the, the sort of, as I said, the molecular biology. And we also work with, um, with some human trials as well, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And sometimes we, um, we take a break from science and manage to, to go for walks in, in the hills as well. Um, and as Claire said, I, um, I'm originally from Wales. Um, a town called uh, Newport, if anybody knows that. Um, I, I moved to Aberdeen uh, when I was very young, when I was about 18, um, to study, and um, I've, I've been there on and off ever since. And my, um, my better half and my daughter are, are Scottish, so I'm, I'm an adopted Scot. Um, and I, I spent time, as Claire said, in, in the Karolinska Institute in, in Sweden, where a lot of the work I'm going to talk about tonight was, was initiated, and then I've, I've transferred some of that to Aberdeen. I briefly worked at um, University of Copenhagen and Edinburgh as well. So, what is what is circadian rhythm? What am I, what is, uh, what am I actually talking about um, tonight? So, many of you are probably familiar. Well, I assume everyone is is familiar with um, sleep, the sleep wake cycle. So, everyone knows that we we go to sleep at night and we wake up during the day. Um, but you know, what's the the sort of biology that underpins that? So. Um, we, you know, we, we can look at a, a little bit at the sort of physiological components um, of the sleep wake cycle and some of the hormones that actually drive the sleep wake cycle. So, two of these really important hormones are cortisol and, and melatonin, um, and they are sort of inverse in their, their regulation of um, the sleep wake cycle. So, these are really, really important um, hormones that cycle um, in an oscillatory manner. And I'm going to talk a lot today about oscillations over a 24 hour cycle. Um, so if you if you get familiar with this sort of graph and you can look at these oscillations and view them sort of as uh, waves um, rising and falling, um, having peaks and troughs over a 24 hour cycle, this will inform a lot of the, um, the more molecular biology that I'm, I'm going to cover tonight. Um, but if you, if you always have this picture in mind of, of this, we're essentially flattening, in, uh, flattening out a clock into a, a set of waves, um, and that's how we, we often think about circadian rhythms. So, because the Earth um, has a day-night cycle, all, nearly all of biology on Earth has evolved to have a circadian rhythm. So we think that circadian rhythms evolved in biology billions of years ago. Um, they, were, they appear to be, from what we know about evolutionary biology, they appear to be 
I'm involved very early on in the uh, development of, of even single-celled organisms. And we think that's because um, the day-night cycle of the Earth is, is incredibly important to how uh, organisms deal with the sort of the environment they're in. One of the driving factors we believe is UV light. So UV light, um, of course, is what gives us gives rise to life on Earth, gives energy to, to the planet. Um, but as we all know, in, in too high doses, it can be harmful, and that's the same for single-celled organisms as well. So uh, ex exposure to too much UV light can be harmful for uh, even a single-celled organism. So we know that single-celled organisms have actually evolved um, firstly protective mechanisms and also repair mechanisms um, that can deal with the effects of UV light. So we think this is one of the earliest examples of the evolution of, of circadian rhythms. As life has, has become more complex, um, you know, we've evolved into multicellular organisms and complex life has evolved. Um, circadian rhythms evolved along with it and became more complex as well. But we also know that when these rhythms go wrong, they, they are biologically important and they control lots of important biology within the body. But when these rhythms go wrong, they can lead, they can either be involved with or they can actually cause um, diseases. And I'm particularly interested in, in metabolic disease. So going back to um, one of the, the simplest of circadian rhythms, sleep. So most of you probably are aware that, you know, when we don't get enough sleep, we feel terrible in the, in the short term. And if that happens repeatedly over a long time, that can lead to, um, met we, we, that's associated at least with metabolic disease. So to give you an example of this, I was involved in a, a study. Um, I didn't lead this, but I was involved in a study with, with other academic colleagues. So we, we took um, a large sample of, um, people that had, had been recorded over a long period of time in the United States and, and within the sample were about uh, 5,000 participants. Uh, and what we did, it was quite simple, we, so in, in this study the participants had had their sleep um, recorded. So it wasn't uh, what we call the gold standard of, of recording of sleep. We, the, the, uh, the researchers in this study just asked the participants how well they slept, and, and they did that in quite a, um, a, a fairly expansive um, questionnaire. And what we observed in that study is that people who um, got worse sleep uh, had more adiposity, so they had more fat in their bodies, um, and people who, who got more sleep tended to be leaner and more metabolically healthy, and this has been shown um, over several studies, you know, time and time again, we, we see similar findings to this. So we know <coughs> that sleep is incredibly important. But as I said, there are lots of other biological and physiological circadian rhythms. And again, many of these are, you are probably familiar with. So things like coordination times, body temperature, blood pressure, as I said, hormonal secretion, um, and uh, alertness, etc are all things that we know intuitively have circadian rhythms, or at least um, diurnal rhythms. But why, why does this happen? Why do our bodies actually have this? Is, is this just um, a reflection of our diurnal environment, so that the changing of the day to night? I'm going to provide some evidence uh, tonight to show that it's not, that actually we have intrinsic clocks within our body and these allow us to regulate these processes and these have been incredibly important in the evolutionary process and they're also incredibly important in our bodies today. So, as you know, the, the human body is, is made up of, of billions of cells and the majority of cells in our body, nearly, nearly every cell, um, there are certain cells that, that don't have uh, clocks, so nearly every cell in our body has a molecular clock. Um, so this is a, a group of molecules in our cells that knows effectively what time it is, okay? There are certain cells that don't have it, so, so things such as blood cells, um, but the majority of cells in our body have this molecular clock. And we can even take cells out of the body um, and 
show that these cells can keep time. So this is a video I've taken from a, a, a prestigious circadian researcher called Joe Takahashi um, from his lab. And what he's done here, this video will work, yeah, <clears throat> is tagged um, a fluorescent protein to some of these clock genes. And although you can see that many of the cells have, there's a lot of variation in, the, in this population of cells, this was taken over the course of 18 days. You might be able to see this, this post pulsatile kind of light across the whole colony of, of cells here. So what, what this shows effectively is that um, even when we take cells out of the body, they actually remember uh, the time of day, they remember this 24 hour cycle and we can observe these cycles over a 24 hour uh, period in the absence of changes of heat, in the absence of changes of light exposure, these cells are kept in, in constant uh, temperature, constant gas um, concentrations and a, a constant state of, of uh, light exposure. So there are no changes in the, the environment around these cells, but they remember what time of day it is. And I'll show you some other examples um, of that from our work as well. So, what is causing this? Well, the, there are a group of um, genes in the body which, uh, as I said, have been incredibly important in evolution, um, and these are called the molecular clock genes. Uh, and, and some of them are very easy to remember. They have names that uh, make sense. One of the genes is called clock. So um, if you take nothing else away from tonight, you can, you can always impress your friends um, by saying that you know one of the molecular clock genes' names. Um, some of them have uh, slightly more confusing names, such as BML1. Um, and actually, a, a few years ago, the discovery of these genes was awarded the Nobel Prize. So for those of you who don't know, the, the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine uh, is awarded in, at the Karolinska Institute. And um, my former boss, actually, Julian Zeraf, was the first uh, female chair of, of this committee. So it was, it was an amazing uh, honor to sort of work under her at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. Um, in 2017, these group of, these three gentlemen here, uh, Hall, Rochbach and, and Young, um, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for their discovery of clock genes. Um, and, and they discovered these genes in Drosophila flies. So a, a much more simple um, organism than, than us, of course, um, and they're widely used in, in biological research to make groundbreaking discoveries that can potentially then be, be applied to um, more complex organisms such as humans. Um, but these three gentlemen discovered uh, a group of genes that regulate their own cycle over a 24 hour period. And, th and this, as we now know, as I've described, is conserved across um, biology. And, and one good example of this is the um, is in plants? So of course, as many of you know, um, you know, many plants have observable circadian rhythms where we can see either their leaves turn towards the sun, um, or they they have flowers that open and close in response to changes in daylight. Um, and it's now known that part of this rhythm is due to these molecular clock genes, and not just the response to environment. So we can observe many of these biological rhythms <coughs> uh, in the absence of changes of environment as well. Um, and these, so these three gentlemen discovered um, a molecular clock in Drosophila fly, and although we don't have exactly the same genes as human, there are many similarities to um, how these genes work. So they, <coughs> so they, uh, they are activated, and they, um, so genes, what they are is essentially a blu blueprint um, to make protein. So these genes are, are effectively turned on um, for 12 hours and they make protein. Those proteins uh, from the amount of clock then activate the expression of, of these other clock genes. Um, and these genes are abbreviated here, but their names are period, again related to time, and cryptochrome, again related to time, the Latin for time. Um, and, and the, then pear and cry then go on to repress these clock genes in a beautiful, um, what we call an auto-regulatory, so a self-regulating um, loop. Um, and this sort of beautiful biology 
actually enables our, our cells to know what time of day it is effectively to keep a 24 hour clock. So this process happens over 12 hours roughly and then uh, this process happens over 12 hours um, and it's incredibly tightly controlled. So this creates a 24 hour clock. And as I said, we can take cells out of the body um, in a consistent environment <clears throat> and observe this biology as well. Now, the really interesting thing is that these genes are uh, effectively what we call sort of master regulators inside the cells. So they control the, um, the expression or the metabolism of many, many other groups of genes. Uh, and depending on the tissue, they have a, a larger or lesser role. Um, so for instance, in immune, the immune system, the immune system is very, very responsive to environment. So clock genes probably have a slightly less important role. Um, but in the tissue that I'm particularly interested in, which is skeletal, <coughs> skeletal muscle, uh, these genes seem to have a, a very, very important role. Um, and I'll go on to talk a little bit about that later. But some of the things that these genes can control is, is metabolism, energy balance, hormone secretion, sleep, and just I've just written there, biological pathways. So um, effectively what I'm trying to get across here is that they can regulate almost anything in a cell um, depending on, on the tissue. <clears throat> so, as I said earlier in the talk, you know, what happens when these clocks tick out of time? Um, so, there are lots of examples of this. Um, I'll just draw your attention to one, which is probably something you're all familiar with, which is, you know, shift work or any sort of artificial disruption of our, our normal circadian rhythm. So, clearly, um, humans are <clears throat> diurnal animals, so, you know, we, we are supposed to be normally um, awake in the day and, and asleep at night, but clearly many um, people, uh, you know, are uh, obligated to um, change that rhythm in, in some way, whether that's a caring responsibility or, um, you know, an, an occupation of another type or shift work. Um, what we know from uh, observational studies and associative studies is that night shift work um, is associated with a much, much greater uh, rate of type 2 diabetes, a much greater risk of developing um, type 2 diabetes and obesity. <coughs> um, and interestingly, uh, particularly, this is particularly relevant in rotating shift work. So um, when people are in consistent night shifts, there is still an elevated risk of disease. Um, but this is particularly observable in people who switch from night shifts to day shifts, um, as many NHS workers currently do. So at the Forrester Hill site in Aberdeen, <coughs> we have about 14,000 uh, healthcare workers who work a similar pattern to this. So it, it's, a, it's a huge population of, of shift workers in Scotland um, who actually perform these sort of rotating shifts. Um, and we know you know, many, there's many, many associative observation studies. Um, not all of these associations are causative. So as, as uh, a scientifically literate crowd are probably aware of, I imagine, you know, uh, <coughs> correlation does not equal causation. But we have pretty good reason to think that this association is uh, at least partly causative because it's also dose dependent. So the longer people work shift work, the higher um, their risk of disease is. <clears throat> and also the, the um, number of night shifts work per, per month is associated with increased uh, risk of disease as well. <laughs> what we also know as well is we can um, replicate shift work in a lab. So um, researchers in, in Harvard have, have done this. Um, and even after one night of a, a, a shift work pattern, a rotating shift work pattern, um, people's insulin sensitivity decreases <clears throat> by about uh, 25%. So people with type 2 diabetes on average probably have um, insulin sensitivity reduction of about 30 to 40%. So even after one night of, of replicated um, shift work, people appear to be well on their way to developing some of the uh, biological phenomena associated with type 2 diabetes. So, you know, we have good reason to think that this correlation is, is, there's at least some causation in this correlation as well. Okay, so now that we know that, um, you know, artificial disruption of circadian rhythms is associated with 
uh, increased risk of metabolic disease. You know, is this important in a, in a intrinsic manner <coughs> in diseases itself? So does it go the other way, i.e. when these uh, molecular clocks are disrupted from inside the body, is that associated with disease as well? So th this is what I um, uh, studied when I was at the, the Kavalinsky Institute. Um, I'm really interested in skeletal muscle, as I said. And the, re <clears throat> the reason skeletal muscle is important um, in type 2 diabetes is it takes up the majority of sugar after a meal. So the ability to store sugar is, is critically important in, in type 2 diabetes. If we lose that ability, um, that means our pancreas has to produce more insulin uh, and that can, then can lead to um, disruptions and dysfunction of uh, insulin production. And that's what leads to diabetes, it's that type 2 diabetes, it's that dual dysfunction of insulin sensitivity and then uh, insulin secretion. We think, at least in some many cases of, of di type 2 diabetes, the first uh, dysfunction is actually in the skeletal muscle. So researchers have observed um, skeletal muscle dysfunction in people with type 2 diabetes up to 10 years before they have an observable uh, clinical outcome, so a change in their blood sugar. So we think at least in uh, you know, a, a fraction of type 2 diabetes cases, the skeletal muscle is actually the primary dysfunction. So, so the point is skeletal muscle is, is critically important in, in type 2 diabetes. Uh, how do we assess skeletal muscle? So <clears throat> skeletal muscle is, is quite a nice tissue in some ways because it's quite close to the skin. We can actually get at it pretty easy. Um, and they are much, much better at doing this in Scandinavia uh, for many, many cultural, political reasons. They just um, have less bureaucracy than we do in, in the UK. Um, we are, in the UK, we're much more risk averse than they are, which I think I'm not making a judgment on that. There's, there's pros and cons. Um, but <clears throat> there, are, there are several ways to take skeletal muscle biopsies. So the Scandinavians often go in for uh, this um, particularly brutal technique, um, which is called forceps. So the um, and apologies if you're if you've just eaten your dinner. Um, so the clinicians will make an incision in the fascia of the muscle after local anaesthetic, um, and they will use what we call you know effectively tongs here to uh, rip out um, uh, sections of muscle, um, and we can get. Uh, as, I, as I put here, a lot of tissue here, but it's uh, highly invasive and um, uh, depending on how it goes, it can be quite painful for some of the participants. So um, we, we have uh, nerve cells in our muscle. I, I once observed a participant, um, that, uh, a nerve cell came out with uh, this, this tissue and um, that didn't look very, very pleasant. Um, but it's fantastic for us scientists because we can get uh, a lot of tissue to study. Um, in the middle is the uh, Bergstrom uh, needle, in my best Swedish accent, um, where it's sort of in the middle. And in the UK, we, we typically use um, microbiopsies, which are much, much less invasive, but we get slightly less um, tissue. Uh, and what we what we can do with this tissue, we can, we can study it in, in sort of some of the traditional um, kind of ways of, of biology and, and assess um, all the sort of biological pathways. <clears throat> but we can also uh, get cells from it. So we effectively get um, stem cells from the muscle. We can grow them in, uh, in a lab, <coughs> um, in, a, in, a, in a dish, in a, in a cell culture dish. Um, and we can differentiate these cells um, into, so. Uh, I don't actually have a picture of, of the stem cells, but they're just effectively little dots in, in, the, in the dish, not very interesting. Um, but we can differentiate these into what we call myotubes. Um, and you can see that these are starting to somewhat uh, mimic um, what you might expect in a, in a skeletal muscle um, in the body. So they're starting to form these long uh, fibrous kind of cells. And what's happening here is, is many, many cells are fusing together. Um, so these cells are multinucleated, so they have um, normally about four uh, nuclei in, in a cell in, in culture. But in the body, um, the longest muscle cell is normally in our vastus lateralis, and it's, it's actually about this long. So it actually goes about um, halfway down the thigh. So it's a <clears throat> muscle cells in the body are 
actually hugely long cells with many, many nuclei um, along the cell that, um, and these nuclei um, regulates uh, each uh, local sort of area of the cell, kind of like a, a local council um, in, in the body. And we hope they're uh, more effective than many local councils. <laughs> So it's really a, an amazing model to, to study because um, you know, growing cells in a dish, <clears throat> it can often be a, a long, long way from what's actually happening in the body. Um, so having this model gets us a little bit closer to what's actually happening in, in the body. Uh, and a, a good example of this is that these, these cells, similar to cardiomyocytes, the, they actually um, spontaneously contract. So without any electrical stimulation, you can see, hopefully there, that we, we observe um, spontaneous contraction of these cells when they're, when they're in culture. I'll just show that again. So, yeah, uh, that's exciting for me anyway. But, uh, <laughs> um, but we can also um, augment this process with uh, electrical pulse stimulation, which is effectively, we just put electrical probes into the, the media here, um, and we get the cells to contract on a rhythmic basis. So that is, um, again, a lot closer to the, the environment in the body um, compared to many other sort of cell types that many scientists work with. So we're very fortunate to be, to, um, <clears throat> to be able to do this. Um, and uh, yeah, just to explain here again, you know, why muscle is important. So um, we produce insulin, it hits these receptors on, on our cell membranes, on muscle cells. Um, glucose, oh, sorry, sugar transporters then move from the inside of the cell to the cell membrane. And the most important one in muscle is, is GLUT4. Um, and this is how uh, um, we store sugar after a meal. So. Again, muscle takes up the majority of sugar after a meal, and, it, and it's by this process here. But again, what my um, former supervisor or, um, in, in the Carolinas, Julian Zeroff and Harriet uh, Wahlberg Henriksen uh, and, and other scientists discovered is that um, this process can happen independent of insulin in response to exercise. So exercise is critically important for people with type 2 diabetes not only because it improves muscle and it augments this process, also because it, it um, allows sugar transporters to work independent of insulin. So even if these people with type 2 diabetes are not producing enough insulin, exercise can uh, stimulate uptake of, of sugar in, in the, the muscle. <clears throat> and also important in this process are mitochondria. So mitochondria are, I'm not going to go too much into to what they do um, for the sake of time, but they are what power our cells. Um, so they are the sort of the energy powerhouses of the cell. They have lots of other functions I'm not going to go into. Um, but they, one of their roles is, is effectively, and I'm going to use a colloquial term here, so any biochemist in the audience please don't um, attack me, but uh, they effectively burn uh, fat and sugar. So when we take up sugar, by well, this sugar transporter here, um, a lot of it is going to mitochondria and that allows the muscle to deal with the sugar in a proper way um, without sort of damaging the cell. So coming back to um, the molecular clock. Um, so as I said, this is just recapping what I've shown you earlier. So nearly every cell in the body has this, this molecular clock um, and muscle is, is no different. So actually in, in muscle, the molecular clock appears to be uh, particularly important compared to other tissues. Um, so from the literature, we can see that you know, this, uh, and many of these are, are mouse models where um, these mice have either had these genes taken out or um, increased in some way. Um, and we can see that in mice, we know that this molecular clock um, is really important for sugar uptake, for exercise capacity, um, and for the mitochondrial respiration, which I just uh, described there. And also, critically, for insulin sensitivity. <coughs> so we're building up a picture here that's the, not only artificially disrupting the clock, 
might be important for metabolic disease, but an intrinsic disruption of the clock <coughs> might actually be important as well. So losing some of these genes in mice, at least, <coughs> shows us that many of these critically important systems in diabetes um, are, are heavily affected. And, and these mice, um, particularly when they lose genes like, again, remember uh, clock and BMAL, uh, when these mice lose these, these really important clock genes, they actually display a lot of the um, similar kind of phenotype, a lot of the similar um, outcomes as people with type diabetes. So what one of the, when I was doing my postdoctoral uh, research, one of the questions I, I wanted to ask is, is the molecular clock intrinsically disrupted in people with type 2 diabetes in their muscle? So <clears throat> in other words, when we take muscle cells out of the body, and there's no um, environmental confounding factors that sort of muddle uh, the, the circadian rhythm and confuse us. When we grow these cells in culture without any changes in, in heat, light, or, um, or gas, or any other sort of nutrients, <clears throat> do these cells uh, uh, have an intrinsically disrupted rhythm? So we, we, what we did is, is uh, a very similar process to what I just showed you in, in terms of obtaining uh, primary cells. And we were in Scandinavia, so we did use the, the brutal uh, method to get a lot of tissue to make sure we had plenty of cells to do this experiment with. We then grew the cells and differentiated them into these long myotubes. Um, and then we collected the cells uh, over several days. So we worked as a team. Um, there, was, there was four of us primarily doing this experiment and we were you know, disrupting our own circadian rhythms in rotating night shift uh, pattern to actually collect these cells. Um, and, and what we, we measured, gene expression and also um, oxygen consumption rate, which is a, a proxy for mitochondrial function. Um, and I'm not, you know, you don't need to fully understand these methods, but one of the main takeaways, what we observed, <clears throat> is again coming back to clock. Um, this particularly important uh, gene in the molecular clock. So what we have here in the in the black is we have the um, we have participants who were matched for age and BMI to our, um, our participants with diabetes, uh, but these participants were otherwise healthy. So in black here we have people who are sort of healthy do, do not have diabetes. And in red, we have participants who are matched for age and BMI who do have diabetes. Um, and what you can see is that the, um, um, and we've drawn a, a mathematical kind of line of best fit here. Um, but I think even if you look at the dots, which is the individual participants' values, um, you can see that the, the gene expression first is a bit higher, but secondly, it has this sort of beautiful um, rhythm uh, over this, this period of time that we measured it. We, we observe, um, when we sort of start our experiments, we observe quite a lot of variability in the first 12 hours. So that's why we, we start at 12 hours. Um, we, we just find that from optimizing our experiments. But so we keep these cells sometimes for three days, depending on the experiments we're doing, sometimes for sort of just over two days um, in the same condition, same culture, um, and we measure their gene expression, as I said. And you can see that the, the healthy participants have this um, beautiful rhythm of clock. Uh, and, and what we do is we use an um, algorithm to measure the circadian rhythm to tell us if it's circadian or not. So we have a, a kind of yes, no outcome. Remember that we're measuring you know, 14,000 genes uh, <coughs> across the transcriptome. Um, and this, this algorithm then gives us a yes, no answer for each gene. Um, but it came, you know, what we observed in particular was the core clock were some of the most obvious genes where the people with diabetes lost their rhythm. So they lost their sense of time, effectively. So what we're observing here is these people with diabetes have an intrinsically disrupted clock in their muscle. Again, without any changes in environment, their muscle clock is disrupted. <clears throat> we did quite a lot more work on this paper, um, and what we, we saw, we sort of identified how these molecular clock genes were then regulating mitochondria, 
And we observed that the mitochondrial rhythms were really similar as well. So the healthy participants had normal mitochondrial rhythms, um, increased you know, in the day, decreased at night. And again, these were, were remembered in their cells that we took from their body. But the people with diabetes lost their mitochondrial rhythms. Um, and as I said before, that's really important because we have <coughs> evolved uh, rhythms in order to anticipate events in the day. So our mitochondria are, um, have higher capacity to, again, burn uh, sugar and, and fat during the day because that's when we eat, that's when we do physical activity. So that's when we need them to be active. And at night, they undergo repair processes because those processes of um, metabolizing fat and, and sugar are quite damaging. They produce a lot of things called reactive oxygen species, and they damage the mitochondria, and they damage some of the proteins nearby, and, and potentially the nucleus as well. So we need repair processes in the night to repair mitochondria and repair the cells around it. So if we lose these rhythms, not only are we not anticipating breakfast, lunch, dinner, and we're not dealing with the sugar properly from those meals, we're also not uh, potentially not being able to uh, perform physical activity, and we're potentially uh, also not able to have these repair processes at night. And that's actually been observed in people with diabetes, that they have um, mitochondria that don't repair, that don't um, form these beautiful sort of networks of mitochondria, um, and, and you know, they're not able to function in the same way as, as uh, uh, healthy people. So, I talked a little bit there about um, exercise, you know, physical activity, muscle, of course, very important in physical activity, mitochondria, also very important. So what, what happens um, when we exercise? You know, do muscle clocks affect exercise? So I've actually I've got a question uh, for the audience. So when do you think, what do you think is the best time of day to set a world record? Any suggestions? Okay, so a few different answers. Someone said uh, evening, someone said two o'clock afternoon. So people who said late afternoon, evening, you are probably right. Um, we actually think that is the case. Well, that is, so the majority of world records are set in the late afternoon, evening. Now, there are clearly, uh, as, a, as I mentioned earlier, correlation is not causation. So there are confounding factors that we need to be aware of. Uh, as you would imagine, many um, of the world's elite athletes tend to have their finals um, in the evening due to TV scheduling, etc. Um, and th there are other you know, cultural reasons why people might perform at their best in the evening setting. But we actually think there is a, a physiological um, component to this as well, as you probably imagine me to see. Um, and some of the literature behind this, so I've, I've shown you the, the mouse models where we know that the core clock does affect um, exercise capacity. So when we take the molecular clock out of muscle in, in mice, they tend to have worse um, exercise capacity. Uh, but what we know as well is that many of these really important phenomena for um, exercise capacity, such as mitochondrial <laughs> function, actually coalesce with these core clock genes. And they tend to do that in the, um, in the evening, uh, effectively. And we also observe, um, when we do uh, studies in a lab, without the confounding factors of you know, TV scheduling, uh, whatever other sort of confounding factors might affect world records, when we do this in a lab, uh, in, in, in much more sort of controlled conditions, we see that exercise performance, at least particularly in terms of high intensity um, strength exercise, tends to peak in the, the late afternoon um, evening as well. Uh, and this is you know, particularly interesting, as I said, because it coalesces with these core clock gene uh, expression. So we think there is um, a biological component uh, to why world records are actually set in the afternoon evening as well. I, I spoke earlier about um, some of the 
you know, resetting, uh, sorry, uh, uh, how we can use electrical stimulation to contract muscle cells in the dish. Um, and my, my colleagues in, in Copenhagen have actually shown that uh, using electrical pulse stimulation at different time points can reset the circadian rhythm. So you can see um, in, in this blue line, for instance, here, we have this uh, beautiful circadian rhythm. Um, here, one of these called clock genes. Um, and then what they've done is, is use electrical pulse stimulation, contracting the muscles, mimicking exercise in a dish at several time points, and they've actually reset um, many of these, these core clock rhythms here. So moving back to from cells to um, the, the whole body, and, and moving back to diabetes as well, you know, we, we think that the molecular clock is important in um, exercise response capacity. Uh, we know that exercise is, is critically important for people with type, type 2 diabetes. So, um, again, this was done while, while I was at the Karolinska. We actually wanted to know, you know, does doing exercise at different times a day change the, um, the blood sugar of people with diabetes? And to our surprise, this, this had never been studied in the literature before. It, it seems like quite a simple question. So we, we uh, this is quite a small kind of pilot study. So we, we recruited 11 people with diabetes um, and we got them to exercise in the morning for two weeks uh, and then in the evening for two weeks uh, in a randomized fashion. So they either did morning or evening and then they they, they then did the opposing um, album of the child. So everyone in the study did morning and evening exercise for two weeks. Uh, and we gave them continuous uh, glucose monitors. So many of you are probably familiar with these. Many people with diabetes now have um, little monitors that they wear on the back of their arms, which uh, tell you their blood sugar um, throughout the course of the day. So a fantastic tool for circadian researchers because it allows us to track blood sugar levels remotely um, over the course of 24 hours for up to two weeks. <clears throat> so what we saw here, and we got these participants doing high intensity training. So this is what we call HIT here. Um, as I said, we, we observed <clears throat> the, um, the biggest sort of changes uh, in exercise capacity from the literature in high intensity exercise. So we're not sure if this would be the same for uh, more moderate intensity exercise, which I'll come to um, in a few minutes. Um, but what we observed is when the participants did morning exercise, surprisingly, because you know we expect exercise to be good for, for blood sugar, the, the muscles should be contracting, glucose transport is moving to the cell surface, taking up sugar. Exercise generally is associated with better regulation of blood sugar. Um, and you can see, in fact, in the afternoon, this in blue here, the blood sugar trace, the, the gray is the baseline, so we measured them two weeks before starting the study. Um, so we have their normal blood sugar, um, but when we when they did after, <clears throat> afternoon exercise, they have a reduction in, the, in their blood sugar, as one might expect from exercise, because we know exercise is normally good for people with diabetes. Surprisingly, when they did very high intensity exercise in the morning, uh, their blood sugar was was much higher than um, than a baseline. So this was a really, really surprising finding uh, for us, and, and this study has been um, kind of well cited by many scientists in the field, and I think it was picked up by the New York Times as well. <clears throat> um, so it, it might look a bit scary, um, actually, to, to someone with diabetes, you know, uh, and I've been asked all the time, do you, should you um, refrain from doing high, you know, exercise in the morning? But you know, we, we don't know the mechanism behind this. Um, this was a pilot study, so I would uh, note a hint of, of caution of, of how far we interpret these findings. But something, so when I came to Aberdeen, something I was really interested as well was, you know, given this disruption of, of mitochondria um, and, and this these intrinsic disruption of, of clocks in the muscle of people with diabetes, we know that many medicines actually uh, are processed by, uh, or partly processed or affect mitochondria. Um, and one of these is metformin. So metformin is um, the most commonly prescribed initial uh, medicine for people with type 2 diabetes. So 
many people with type 2 diabetes, um, <coughs> after a while of seeing a doctor, the, the blood sugar control might be um, not optimal. The doctor might suggest um, vitamin <coughs> metformin. It's been used since the 1960s. Um, it's a very, very effective medicine for diabetes um, and, and pretty, pretty safe overall. It has very, <coughs> very few side effects. But one of the side effects or interactions it does have is when people uh, perform exercise, which again, as I said, is really, really important for diabetes and, and for general health overall. Um, there's no additive effect of uh, exercise on blood sugar regulation. Uh, we think that metformin may make exercise feel harder for, for people who are on metformin. Um, we also see that metformin seems to interact with the, the muscle in particular to um, blunt the effects of exercise effectively. So something I wanted to study in Aberdeen is, um, you know, can we use what I call chronomedicine, so effectively timing some of the things we do in a day more optimally. And I think <clears throat> this could well come into play in the future a lot more because more and more people are going to be using wearable devices such as physical activity monitors, <clears throat> such as uh, glucose monitors. There's going to be a whole host of other types of monitors that are going to come onto the market, I think, in the next five to ten years. And I believe that having these 24-hour data um, is going to be m much, much more important for people at the individual level and also for healthcare services. Um, and again, having this 24-hour data, whereas previously, we often get a, a single time point snapshot of people coming into a clinic, having a blood test, having this 24 hour data allows us to um, consider timing events, timing medicine, timing meals, timing exercise, timing uh, whatever you can imagine as part of a, um, a treatment plan for a disease. So I think um, chronomedicine, precision timing of some of these treatments is going to become much, much more important um, in the future. and that's something we wanted to sort of investigate um, well, you know, when I moved to Aberdeen. And I, I recruited my, my first PhD student. Um, coincidentally, she's also she's called Brenda. So my lab was, at that point was two people, Brenda and Brenda. It's a bit unusual, a bit confusing, but uh, there we go. Um, so we, uh, and we, did this, we started this study during COVID. Um, so we, we weren't allowed to do any face-to-face -face work. So another benefit of um, uh, this wearable technology is we can send it out in the post and record people in real time and if they weren't um, adhering to our, our predetermined, <coughs> pre-agreed upon uh, criteria for exercise they, they might expect a phone call from Brenda or Brendan um, to, to uh, have a strong debate with them about their adherence to the study. Um, so what we did here, we recruited um, 18 participants. We, we hope to get more actually in this study, but many of the participants um, unfortunately did get COVID during the study. So um, one of those things. Uh, and we, we set this study up in a relatively similar to, way to what I described previously. So we had a two week baseline where we um, monitored uh, physical activity, blood sugar, and we also collected um, food diaries from them. So we, we had a rough idea of what they were eating we also asked them to record their metformin intake. So all these participants were taking metformin uh, monotherapy. So just metformin um, in terms of regulating their blood sugar. So we also asked them to, to record when they took metformin. Um, and that's going to be really important in the study. We then asked them to do a morning exercise for six weeks or evening exercise. They had a two week washout period. Uh, and then they did the opposite arm of the trial. So it was, it was quite a long uh, study and the, the participants were fantastic. You know, the ones that finished the study, um, you know, they, they really did adhere well to the, the exercise program. I'll, I'll just briefly show you one of the, the, the main findings from this study. So we saw that morning exercise was slightly better in the study at controlling blood sugar, but this was almost entirely driven by participants that took metformin before their breakfast. Um, so you can see, again, not huge numbers in the study, so uh, treat these findings with a little bit of caution, but you know, we think this could be the start of, of further research. Um, but it seems to be this combination between morning exercise and pre-breakfast metformin that actually is driving down blood sugar 
quite substantially if you compare to the post-breakfast uh, um, cohort here. So we think is that there is some interaction of timing of these two phenomena, um, metformin intake and uh, exercise as well. So, you know, clearly we're a long way from this, these recommendations, but, you know, we think maybe in the future um, we could sort of turn these, these findings into more clinically relevant uh, instructions and, and kind of good simple messages potentially to, um, you know, maybe to sort of small cohorts of people in terms of the, the timing of some of their um, management of their disease. So, um, I think we're, we're sort of coming to the end um, here, so I'll, I'll just kind of summarize and, and show you, you know, talk about what uh, we talked about tonight. So, you know, what, what I'm particularly interested in is, you know, we, I think we've shown that people with type 2 diabetes have intrinsically disrupted core clocks um, and mitochondrial rhythms in their skeletal muscle. That might affect um, how their cells handle sugar and many other things such as pharmaceutical interventions like metformin um, and maybe you know we can actually time some of these kind of events um, better to sort of improve uh, disease uh, management. Um, so I probably don't have time to go through this study but just to say that um, with colleagues in France we uh, actually did a study with Toulon Rugby mm. Um, so with the junior athletes, and they, um, they're in a very, very highly controlled environment. So they're teenage athletes, and they actually um, have phones banned uh, throughout the day. Uh, they're not allowed to drink coffee. So a fantastic group of people to study for circadian biologists. Um, and <clears throat> it's a quite hierarchical um, uh, environment as well, so they're, they're really good at doing what they're told. Um, so just quickly, in, in this study, we looked at sort of, um, you know, different times of training, and how that affected sleep, um, and I'll just touch quickly on, um, within this study, we, we observed that people with different chronotypes, so um, a lot of you might be, might be familiar with sort of um, early birds or night owls, you know, people have different intrinsic uh, kind of preferences for when they sleep, when they're more active, when their brain's more active. We saw differences in sleep outcomes um, with people with different, who are either more, uh, early birds or night owls um, when they did training at different times. So as you might expect, it wasn't that surprising really, the finding that early birds who did <coughs> training in the evening didn't sleep very well, whereas night owls didn't mind that they, they could tolerate training in the evening. Um, so I think I think I've, I've summarised that tonight. Um, and before I finish, I just want to thank uh, my my colleagues and collaborators um, at the Karolinska Institute at the University of Copenhagen, my, my funders, <coughs> and uh, also my my team of PhD students um, in the University of Aberdeen. And uh, thank you all for listening. Yes. Oh, now I've got to run around. Like <laughs> 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 Evening exercise. Yeah. Okay. Go for it. Just speak into it. Um, you mentioned somewhere in the first six slides. You mentioned that different parts of the body also have their own circadian rhythms, mm -hmm. uh, and you have the intestines. I think you have the liver, and I can't remember the other one. So, is you also talked about the body kind of not being in sync. So when you talk about these different parts of the body having their own circadian rhythms, do they all have to have the same rhythm at the same time? And if they don't have the same rhythm at the same time, is that actually a cause of something happening? And for instance, uh, could it be that the intestinal cells also will affect diabetes, the possibility of diabetes, etc.? Yeah, I think you get the point. Yeah. Great question. So, thank you. What well, I didn't really cover um, in, in detail, but the 
Yes, there are, there are clocks in nearly every cell in our body and nearly every tissue has some form of circadian rhythm. One of the most important circadian rhythms, as you might expect, is in the brain. Um, and actually a particular region of the brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN, um, is very closely connected to the eyes. So that is uh, set by daylight uh, in particular. So daylight seems much more important than artificial light for um, setting our circadian rhythm. The SCN then, mainly through uh, hormonal regulation, actually plays a big role in regulating these other clocks in our muscles, in our intestines, in our liver. So that's the reason why, one of the main reasons why a lot of these clocks normally are in sync, but yes, you're entirely correct. Um, many of these clocks can become out of time with the SCN for various reasons. And that can lead to disease. Uh, also, if people don't get enough um, daylight, that can also um, uh, lead to disrupted rhythms as well. So, you know, many people who have uh, sleep disorders, um, it's also associated with um, lack of exposure to daylight as well. How much of a factor or consideration is latitude? Uh, yes, great question. Great question. So, um, it, it definitely is a factor. There's not that much research in terms of the sort of metabolic rhythms that's been done uh, so I think it's, it's certainly important um, <clears throat> we know you know in, in the north in the northern hemisphere we have uh, or the northern latitudes um, so obviously I worked in, in Sweden and uh, the north of Scotland um, there were you know huge seasonal changes in, in daylight exposure um, and we have to account for that in our studies so, you know, in the winter, uh, we actually, it, it is, this is a known phenomenon as well, that people with diabetes have much worse glucose control on average in the winter than they do in the summer. And we think that part of the reason for that is the lack of daylight exposure. So um, my advice would be in, in the winter, you know, it's really important to get out in the middle of the day, get some daylight exposure, um, and that helps reset your SCN and your circadian, your metabolic circadian rhythms as well. Just a follow-up from that, is diabetes more common in northern latitudes than, say, the equatorial region? Or, uh, yeah, that's, I think that's a difficult question to answer. I mean, it is more prevalent, but there's also, there's so many environmental factors that it's hard to say whether that's due to circadian rhythm. So, you know, it, it tends to be, historically it's been more prevalent in the industrialised countries because of many many factors a lack of physical activity and, and a change in our we have much more highly processed foods in, in industrialized countries diabetes is now becoming much much more prevalent in um, uh, developing countries as well in fact some of those are now overtaking that the prevalence in developing countries is overtaking uh, diabetes prevalence in, in um, the uk and the us and europe so yeah it, it's a hard question to, to answer yeah. David. When I was young, I noticed I had a tendency to follow a lunar rhythm, rising an hour later every day, if left to myself. Um, and I remember reading that some people, quite a lot of people, have a biological clock that runs slow. Does that happen at all at the cellular level? Yes, yeah. <clears throat> it does, yeah. Um, so what, one of the things we observed is that the, the clocks in, in people from diabetes had low expression, uh, they were less robust, and often they, they tended to be a little bit longer than 24 hours. So that's hence why they were becoming disrupted. Uh, and that's also observed with aging as well. Um, so it's been shown a few times now that taking either taking cells out of the body um, from people who are older compared to people who are younger, this is the, the rhythms will be 25 hours, maybe 26 hours, a bit longer than 24 hours, hence why they become disrupted. So that is often associated with um, uh, disease and, and aging. Um, but you know, clearly th there are uh, also mutations in the clock genes that, that are prevalent in the population as well that might affect those rhythms as well. Yes. Um, when you said there that you were looking at older people and does their uh, physical sort of like the activity levels, does that dictate 
the length of their security levels and the length of call it. Uh, it's like healthier and fitter people would have yes. shorter circadian rhythms. Uh, absolutely, yeah. So, um, yeah, again, studies have, have, um, done what have been done. Uh, so a group of researchers in the Netherlands have done a lot of these studies. Uh, where they, they've taken people who are very fit, they've taken people who are uh, sort of normal, and they've taken people who are overweight or have diabetes. And um, they see you know, similar findings to us that the, <coughs> the people who are very, very fit have really strong, robust circadian rhythms and it, it decreases uh, with the, the disease state. So yeah, I think it increases the robustness of circadian rhythms. Um, and uh, with aging, I think there's you know, many, many biological kind of processes that intrinsically disrupt it as well. I actually have a question. So through no fault of my own, at one point in my career, I found myself in a job where I had to commute to Asia regularly. I mean, all the time. And so I had jet lag, like, all the time. Um, and this went on for several years. Is that likely to have messed up my health? That's <laughs> 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 a, a serious question, actually. Yeah. Um, the effects of jet yeah. lag on circadian rhythms and your health. Yeah, I mean, jet lag absolutely disrupts your circadian rhythm. Um, and again, uh, you know, lots of studies have, have try to sort of show the, the um, disruption effect in a lab. You know, the problem we have that there's also other confounding factors when we, we, we fly on a long distance flight, um, we're commuting for work, etc. There's lots of factors that, that, that can affect our um, short-term kind of health. So things like glucose regulation, uh, insulin sensitivity, etc. You know, they are all, all shown to be negatively affected by long, uh, uh, long travel distances. But I think you're right that um, disruption of circadian rhythm clearly does occur from, from long distance flights. Uh, and I think that's part of the, the factors that actually can cause uh, slightly, at least on the short term, negative health outcomes from long term travel. But the good news is that you, know, you can mitigate that um, if you sort of, uh, do, do lots of healthy things um, in, in the short term as well. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, how do I get there? <laughs> Could you pass the... Talk about uh, exercise. Oh uh, yeah, exercise. <laughs> so my question is, has your research into this field inspired you to um, modify your own personal habits? <laughs> so that, to, to, to the point where you feel broadly and generally that you're experiencing benefits, that would be difficult to measure with the sort of precision of the, of the experiments you've been doing? Well, that's a good question. That is a very good question. I, I, <laughs> I think, you know, Thank you. along with many uh, academics, I would say very much um, practice what I preach, not what I, what I do. Um, you know, but uh, I do try to um, exercise when I've, I've stepped off the plane um, and, or, you know, I've, I've um, sort of had a, a night shift in the lab, for instance, I, I clearly find exercise very beneficial on a short-term basis um, and a long-term basis as well. Um, and I, we're, you know, in the lab, we're always um, playing around with lots of the wearable technology, uh, measuring our own blood sugar. So we, we have a pretty good idea of, of what changes our blood sugar. I know that um, after a few, uh, few uh, social activities on a Friday night, <laughs> on a Saturday morning, my blood sugar is, is much less uh, well regulated. So yeah, um, but exercise can mitigate that much of Sure. I'm, going to, I'm going to pursue you once again on the jet lag question because I'm sure there's quite a few people here travel. Um, so jet lag is a disruption of the circadian rhythm? Yeah? Yeah. So is, what's yeah. the best strategy then for dealing with jet lag? Oh, yeah, I'm cautious to answer that because I, I don't think it's, I don't think there's strong enough evidence to say that there is a, a perfect strategy. But, um, we know, you know, what I've shown is, is exercise is a pretty potent regulator of the muscle clock. We also know that it affects lots of other circadian rhythms in the body. And clearly daylight, uh, as I was saying earlier, is, is really important as well. So I think getting fresh air, daylight, exercise, um, along, you know, to wake yourself up is good. And then not having those things near your bedtime 
uh, is good as well. And now obviously adjusting your body uh, as much as you can to the local time zone if you're gonna be there for, for more than a week or so. Question, yes. Oh, you were gonna do the book of thanks, weren't you? No. <laughs> You talk about daylight, but because we live in a northern country, the recommendation seems to be take vitamin D and vitamin B12 <coughs> and vitamin C. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, um, would that, are there any help or do we, do we need daylight? Uh, yeah, so it, it's, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, that's not my area of expertise at all. Um, it, I know, sorry, apologies, but um, I, I attended a, a really interesting debate recently at the Society for Endocrinology, and, and they had a very interesting debate with um, both sides of the pro-vitamin D supplementation and the anti-vitamin D supplement, supplementation uh, well represented. Um, so I think the, 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 the evidence from the scientific community is, is not clear cut yet in terms of, one of the issues is, uh, um, again, this is a, a correlation versus causation effect. So uh, low levels of vitamin D are associated with poor health. Okay, it sounds really bad. However, um, fat takes up vitamin D, so we store vitamin D in fat. So if people are, uh, have higher adiposity, higher BMI, they tend to have lower BMI. Uh, they tend to have lower vitamin D. Is that because they have lower vitamin D or is that because they are they have higher adiposity? It's not really clear. Um, but and we also know that getting daylight exposure, particularly in the summer, is much, much more effective at um, synthesizing vitamin D and metabolizing it than taking it as a supplement. But there might still be some health benefits to supplementing vitamin D even in the winter. So I can't really give you a clear cut answer <coughs> on that. And, the latest that I've heard from the scientific community is, is divided on that as well. Yes. Yes, young lady. Speak loud and clear. Is diabetes more <coughs> I'm sorry. Is diabetes more likely in younger people than like, older people? <clears throat> uh, great question. So Thank you. <laughs> um, so type 1 diabetes often develops in, in uh, younger people before, uh, before they, they kind of reach maturity. So type 1 diabetes might be um, uh, evident in, in young people. Type 2 diabetes generally uh, is more associated with aging. So people who are, tend to develop it when they're a bit, a bit older as well. Perhaps I could just come oh. add, add to that point. Ah, yes. Um, I always want to use the, the uh, yeah. microphone. Here we go. It partly relates to a comment. Yeah, you can hold it so that it faces your mouth. <laughs> Sorry, that's it. Um, it partly relates to a comment that you made um, about people in the third world countries now yeah. getting more type 2. Mm -hmm. um, so I was a pediatrician looking after children with type 1, mm -hmm. but towards the end of my time, in the 90s and early this century, we were seeing more teenagers with type 2. And then it, that was nearly always associated with increased weight. Uh, and it was actually commoner in our Asian children than in our Caucasian children. Yeah. So it, it is increasing uh, in young children, type 2 as well as type 1. I totally agree. Okay. Uh, so, uh, actually, J Jason Gill and Navid Sattar from the University of Glasgow have done really uh, important um, work looking at ethnic uh, differences and the outcomes of metabolic disease. So, uh, people of um, South Asian descent uh, and ethnicity <coughs> develop metabolic disease on average at a much lower BMI, as, as you suggested, um, than, than uh, people from you know, Europe and, and the US. So, this, there appears to be ethnic differences in the uh, association between adiposity, BMI, and metabolic disease. Mm -hmm. Oh, David so, again. Just to follow oh, yeah. on from what you, you've said there, yeah. does that change if somebody of South Asian origin is still living in South Asia? Yeah. Is that a different outcome than somebody of South Asian <laughs> or origin who's now living in the North? Great question. 
Uh, I think the answer is we probably don't have enough long-term data to really answer that question, but it, it seems to be multi-generational at least. So uh, one of the issues when we look at inherited factors versus environmental factors is genetics are important, but we also have inherited factors that are not genetic, epigenetic as well. <clears throat> and they can change in response to environment, but they can also be passed on, uh, they can also be inherited as well. So it becomes a really confusing picture whether things are uh, intrinsic in the body or whether they're environmental. But uh, I, again, I saw Jason Gill present recently, and I, I, if I remember correctly, his recent uh, or his latest data kind of shows that there is a, a, at least three generational kind of um, effect in, in people whose grandparents have come from South Asia. Um, they still have this, this change in, in metabolism um, compared to people who, who are sort of uh, ethnicity from the, the UK. Yeah. 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 David again. Can I come back to my lunar question? <laughs> from a different angle. Um, uh, from an archaeological angle, a yes. number of people have thought that the lunar cycle was more important to early humans than it is now. And there are various reasons for thinking that. And I wonder if there are any ways of investigating that biologically, thinking about um, differences in the way that uh, circadian rhythms operate. Because uh, things like um, um, prehistoric monuments and the actual living patterns of people who still live somewhat as people did live, say 20,000 years ago, um, might suggest that the lunar cycle was very important for that period. Uh, it, it might well be, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna answer this question by slightly uh, reframing it and then talking about something I wanna talk about. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, you know, as I said, daylight is, is super important to circadian rhythms. I don't know so much about lunar cycles. That would be a, 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 you know, a different type of rhythm rather than a circadian rhythm. It's not a 24 hour cycle, clearly. But um, we know that our circadian rhythms are sort of disrupted by artificial light, our work environments being indoors all day. That disrupts our circadian rhythms. And we think a lot of the chronotype differences that people have are more exacerbated in, in these artificial environments than they are in a more natural environment. So they've actually done studies, uh, again in the US, where they took people with, with very uh, different chronotypes, so more, very, very extreme morning owls and very, very, uh, uh, very extreme morning uh, larks and very extreme night owls. They took them on a, a camping expedition. Um, so they were hiking all day, exposed to daylight, I guess somewhat more uh, similar to you know, what our early ancestors might have had. <clears throat> and what they saw is those, those chronotypes became much more similar. So the exposure to daylight, physical activity, fresh air, made people's rhythms much more similar. So I think that does speak somewhat to your <laughs> question um, in my own reframing of that. Yeah? Do you know if the, uh, <clears throat> do you know the rhythms of both people? So Could I ask you yeah, yeah, so people yeah. Do you know if the, the rhythms in this yeah. tended to to like a general middle, or was it more like the night owls were becoming morning people and the morning people were becoming more night owls? It, um, if I remember the data correctly, um, it, it was track. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't recall if it was middle or morning, but it said it, it was. Um, they were rising at dawn, effectively. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. I am getting my exercise tonight. <laughs> <coughs> so, yeah, if you point it directly towards your mouth, right. yeah. So, um, for type two, this has been type two diabetes, but there's also you've also got like more of the the monogenic diabetes, um, and I was wondering if there's any link between any monogenic types of diabetes and clock genes, or yeah, fantastic question. <coughs> so, there are some early studies that have shown that um, people with uh, polymorphisms in, in the core clock, so uh, you know, single, normally single letter changes in their genetic code in these core clock genes, uh, particularly with the, the period gene actually, the PER3 gene, seems to have an association with poor insulin sensitivity. Um, 
it's very, very early stage data. So we, we know mutations in these cold clock genes are associated with um, sleep disorders. That's very clearly shown. Um, uh, there's some early evidence that it might be associated with metabolic disease. How are we doing? Any more questions? Or is that uh... Some, some reference to seasonal changes. Yep. What's the situation in the Antarctic and the Arctic among people who got to survive seven months of complete darkness? Yeah. Is that due to the circadianisms? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and there have been some studies done in that. It's kind of early days, and I, you know, we just don't have enough data to really say for sure. But um, on the physiological level, clearly, uh, you know, 24 hours of darkness or, or very, very long nights does change the physiological rhythms. We don't know so much about the molecular clock, but I would uh, presume that it's also changed, but we don't know for sure. Oh, yes, here we go. Um, it's the best strategy for this one. There we go. Thank you. It's a short question. I was going to ask you what's your next research topic or what's the thing you really are want to focus on next? So um, we, we're really interested in the kind of metformin interaction. Um, so we, we want to, you know, we, we had that small study during COVID. We want to expand that now and see if we can uh, do a much bigger study and, and sort of apply chronomedicine, apply some of these precise timings of uh, medication, exercise, nutrition to people with diabetes and actually see if that makes a difference in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, that's, that's what we're trying to do and as, as a typical research academic, I'm always applying for funding, so um, <laughs> uh, that's, I'm, I'm going to sell the, the data and project. Um, and also, um, I, I really want to do more research on shift workers. So as I said, we have a huge population of uh, shift work, uh, shift working healthcare workers um, on the Forest Hill site. So um, I think looking at that, uh, and we're, we're actually working with NHS colleagues at the moment to um, sort of show the science that underpins their shift work roster policy. Um, but it would be great to actually, alongside that, collect more data on shift workers and, and give more information, inform kind of inform their decisions on that. What about some mariners who are under sea for long months? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's actually it's a good question because what about submariners? What about astronauts? <laughs> what about Elon Musk sending people to Mars? <laughs> There's a whole lot of. Uh, I, I can totally see that um, you know a lot of occupations yeah. mess with your body rooms. Uh, is a yeah fantastic question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Logistically, a little bit more challenging to, to monitor, but, but it's, easy, um, it's, it's easier for us to uh, monitor people who are right next to us. Than next to us. But we, we, shouldn't always, um, we shouldn't always do science because it's easy, so I, I think it's a great question. And on the astronaut point, uh, just, just quickly, um, uh, some of my colleagues have actually done work on that, particularly on the muscle. So um, a few factors there, the scaging rhythms, but also the weightlessness critically changes muscle yeah. um, and, and there's some evidence that, that radiation exposure as well can, can, um, can change uh, the reactive oxygen species and the way the mitochondria operate. So some really interesting data as well. Okay, well, if there's, um, so maybe one, one last question? Yep, okay. here, here you go, uh, if to use the... Sorry, it's a little bit ridiculous. Well, you said the science shouldn't always be easy. Would you be willing to go into a submarine? To... <laughs> <laughs> if I got grant funding, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. Okay, Rob is going to do a bit of I'm a bit stiff because I'm doing my exercise. <laughs> They hold it right up to your uh, yeah. answer, yes, like the Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gabriel, thank you very much for that. Um, I had to write things down because it's on past my bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I've got here, I've got, uh, this is a lovely example of good science and good communication. That's what this Curious Minds for me is all about. Um, 
I'm not sure if your hair is going around the right way. But it, it actually took me on an emotional roller coaster because I haven't had a jelly bean. <laughs> Yeah, that's quite a big. Sorry, I should have said that quietly. The whole scientific reputation has been destroyed. And <laughs> um, I have to say that it's, uh, it's an emotional roller coaster for me because I haven't had a jelly baby for three years. <laughs> Seriously, and uh, and uh, it's sad to know that my mitochondria are blocked. <laughs> to use a scientific phrase. Um, but then you said, there's hope, we can reset. And then I can tell my partner I can play pickleball every night. <laughs> Which would be very good to do. But no, my metaphor nullifies all that. So you just drop me down again. And then I have to exercise in the morning. <laughs> it's not getting better. Um, so clearly there's lots of work to be done but but that was so interesting and not volunteering for you to take notes <laughs> but uh, finally that was a great talk thank you very much everybody would agree with that